Hello, and welcome to the webcast on oil and grease analysis around the world. I'm Zoe Grosser, Global Marketing Manager at Horizon Technology. My co-author is David Friedman, retired from the EPA Office of Research and Development and principal at David Friedman Consulting. As a chemist, when I first heard oil in Greece, it just seemed crazy to me. It's a very imprecise kind of measurement, but it does have a use, and we show here the definition. It's defined as any material recovered as a substance soluble in the solvent. So it actually, in Europe, you may hear it referred to as hexane extractables. So the principal types of compounds that are included in oil and grease analysis are fats, soaps, fatty acids, hydrocarbons, waxes, oils. So it gives you a, a sort of class of compounds or, or type of materials included in that definition of oil and grease. This chart shows the dissolved and dispersed kinds of materials that you'd find in a total oil and grease measurement. It's from an excellent chapter by Ming Yang, very helpful, a lot of information, and I'd recommend it to anyone who wants more information on this kind of uh, measurement. So now that we've talked a little bit about the definition of oil and grease, what would we use it for? Well, we can use it to identify instances of soil and water contamination by hydrocarbons. And this is a very useful kind of diagnostic. It's general, it's easily applied, it's simple to uh, perform. It's also used to protect wastewater treatment facilities. For example, their processes are very specific and if you end up with an overload of oil and grease, you may kill the bugs that are doing the right stuff. You can use it to prevent sewer line failure, and there's a picture showing fats, oil, and grease built up in a sewer line and may actually eventually clog it. And the picture at the bottom is actually from a very nice video that was produced by Sewer Water Magazine, and you can go online and find that and see them actually working with facilities to reduce the fats, oil, and greases that go down the drain and aren't trapped and can cause uh, sewer line failure. And it can also be used to control pollution, for example, discharge uh, permits. So we'll talk a little bit about that as we go. Here we have a few examples in US environmental programs where this kind of measurement would be used. We've already mentioned the Clean Water Act's National Pollution Discharge Elimination System and the permitting of industries to discharge wastewater into public waterways. The Leaking Underground Storage Tank Regulatory Program is another example. And certainly in petroleum exploration, this would be a very useful indicator of pollution. Of the example programs that we indicated, the EPA NPDES program is certainly the largest. And this is based on the elimination of pollution due to industrial discharges. So categories of industry specify general regulations that are then refined in negotiation for a permit based on discharge characteristics and the waterway accepting the discharge. And I just give one example here, prohibited discharges. So even though an industry may be discharging to a publicly owned treatment works, they still have rules on what they can and cannot discharge. And if they're going to do something that disrupts the processes in the uh, wastewater treatment plant, that could be a very important thing to avoid. On this slide, we see an example clipped from the Code of Federal Regulations. This is for farm-raised catfish processing subcategory. And you can see that oil and grease is listed as one of the effluent characteristics that should be monitored. And they give both a limitation for any one day and for an average over 30 days, indicating that you know they understand that there's certainly going to be some variation over the course of time. But it does give a very clear indication of what would be allowed coming from that industry 
into the waterway or into the publicly owned treatment works and would be refined then with negotiation for a specific permit. So now that we've gone over the definition of oil and grease and we've gone over some of the reasons why one would want to measure this, let's talk about some of the history and the methods that have been developed to do this measurement. The earliest documented method was in the early 1930s. 500 milliliters of wastewater was evaporated to 50 milliliters, neutralized with HCl, evaporated to dryness, and extracted with a solvent. So they dried the wastewater first before doing the extraction. This was inconsistent, didn't include fatty acids, and was extremely time consuming. Methods were developed then to extract the sample with petroleum ether solvent and then reduce the solvent rather than reducing the water first, and this was certainly a time saver. Now petroleum ether is a mixture of different kinds of compounds, and that was replaced by the more uniform N-hexane, which did provide a significant portion of petroleum ether in the first place, so it didn't make the results all that different. Hexane was further replaced then by Freon-113, which reduced flammability while yielding similar results. Now, infrared analysis was introduced as an alternative to gravimetric measurement, and it worked very well with Freon-113 because it's uh, invisible in the infrared. And this increased sensitivity and required less solvent evaporation. However, the system's more expensive and may require more skill to operate. In 1989, use of chlorofluorocarbons began to be phased out due to the Montreal Protocol. So they went back and replaced the chlorofluorocarbons with N-hexane. After a lot of work in trying to find the optimum solvent, hexane was decided to be the solvent of choice and EPA method 1664 was developed. It was first proposed in the Federal Register in January of 1996 and then developed uh, and revised into revision A, revision B. It uses hexane for extraction and it does allow the use of solid phase extraction which can be automated. Here we show some of the equipment that could be used to automate a solid phase extraction of the wastewater for oil and grease. It also includes an evaporation step and there is a device here, the SpeedVap, for automation of the evaporation step as well. So the entire process can be automated more easily when solid phase extraction is incorporated. People around the world often look to standard methods for methods to do environmental analysis. And this slide shows a clip from Standard Methods 5520 showing some of the changes in solvent over the additions of standard methods that have come out over time from 1965 to 1998, showing how standard methods had changed solvents along with um, the US EPA for a variety of different approaches to oil and grease measurement. Here we show the various parts of method 5520 and there is a part, the gravimetric part, that's very very similar to 1664. We also show an ISO method, 11349, which is very similar to method 1664. So there is utility seen around the world in standardized regulatory methods for oil and grease measurement. In addition, oil and grease measurement has sort of started as a base for more detailed methods or methods that use more specific detectors to try to understand better the characteristic of the hydrocarbons that are extracted. 
So for example, there's an OSBAR method which is used for oil platforms in the North Sea, which uses GC, FID. It uses pentane for extraction, but that's very similar to hexane. There's also US EPA method 8015, which uses GC with an FID detector. ISO 9377, again very similar. And then there's the extractable petroleum hydrocarbon analysis, which fractionates the hydrocarbons into um, aromatic and non-aromatic so that you can get a better idea of the toxicity of the general measurement. So there are a number of, of um, different methods that have come out of oil and grease and are more specific. I spoke to a number of Horizons partners around the world to understand better how oil and grease, or if oil and grease measurement is done in their country, and sort of a little overview of the kinds of, of uh, considerations. So in speaking with Canada, Canada's methods are more performance-based than other places. They're not very prescriptive, and they can be modified more freely. Oil and grease are handled a little bit differently. They may be trapped at the wastewater treatment plant and then used for energy generation, so it's seen as a benefit. Industrial wastewater is regulated similarly to Europe, where the amount of contamination determines the discharge payment. So Europe and Canada have taken a little different approach than the U.S., where rather than regulating the amount that can be discharged, they charge for it. So there's an economic incentive to having a smaller wastewater discharge. In the Philippines, they use a gravimetric method with a petroleum ether extraction. Now it does mention also standard methods here, so that's one of the areas where they're referring to standard methods for some guidance on how to perform this methodology. In the Philippines, they have a similar kind of discharge regulation. It's more general than in the U.S. and doesn't have as many industrial categories. But here, they've categorized any plant, manufacturing plant, with a BOD value greater than 300 milligrams per liter and some other characteristics that oil and grease in going into inland waters should be only 10 and for coastal waters, 15. So they are doing some work on trying to uh, better regulate and understand this. And I imagine with some of the recent storms that this is going to be a very important kind of measurement. In Brazil, CETESBI is the regulatory agency and they use both EPA method 1664 or standard methods 5520 and they use hexane as the extraction solvent. They have both water quality standards and discharge limits. And this shows some of the water quality standards uh, for bodies of fresh water. And for oil and grease, virtually absent is the regulation uh, statement. So they are very concerned about the quality of their waters as well. Here we show the effluent discharge standards and the relevant parameters that they are listed for a power plant, El Paso Energy International. And you can see oil in Greece is listed both by their limits and the World Bank limits. So I thought that was kind of interesting. There was someone at uh, my PitCon talk from Brazil, and he said that we pretty much had this right. So I thought that was really an uh, interesting comment. Malaysia has been regulating the environmental aspect of their industry for quite some time. And here you, sh you see the uh, parameter and limits of effluent standards. And this is A and B depending on the kind of water body. Palm oil is one of the largest industrial segments in Malaysia. In fact, when I was there, I visited the palm oil board so it's a very important thing, and they try very hard to explain it to the rest of the world. Anyway, they have the actual 
concentration of oil and grease in the palm oil mill effluent and the regulatory discharge limits listed here. So it goes from 4,000 in the original material to 50, which they're allowed to, to uh, discharge. So they have to do quite a bit of work to clean up the effluent to the discharge limits. China is an amazing place, and it's come a long way in environmental regulation and enforcement, but it still has a ways to go. They do look at oil-bearing wastewater from marine petroleum development industry, and they right now use a carbon tetrachloride extraction and an infrared determination. But I suspect that will develop with time to more modern technology and eliminate some of the highly chlorinated uh, extraction solvent. This slide describes an issue that had come up in China and got a lot of publicity over the past couple of years. It's pretty horrible, actually, but some of the um, oil used in restaurants that may have been actually discharged was being collected and recycled and sold back to some of these restaurants. And it wasn't clean and it wasn't safe and some of the regulations that have gone into place in the past couple of years have been to try to prevent that from happening. So there are machines that are trying to be installed at restaurants that would separate oil and grease before they enter the sewage system so that it would be impossible to retrieve them later and try to recycle them. So to summarize, there's a continued need for a simple, easy to follow method to assess water quality for treatment process performance and environmental protection. And oil and grease testing in this general form can provide a method to do this with the following advantages. It's simple to use, inexpensive, and can be automated if solid phase extraction is included. The method's defined by how it is performed so there's limited flexibility that can be offered before the method becomes something different. The U.S. methods have become adopted in many places around the world and provide a good starting point for more detailed assessment. And we talked about several of those methods as possible uh, outgrowths. I'd like to acknowledge our partners around the world who provided information to help in this talk. Bruna Duarte de Oliveira from Brazil, Tai Chip Li from Malaysia, Nancy Galarte from the Philippines, and Eve Bouchard from Canada. Thank you very much.